Okay. All right. Uh, of course, to introduce you, I should look at what I wanted to say. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Dan Levinson Welk, Professor of American History at SUNY Fashion Institute of Technology. I'd like to welcome Abigail DeVille to my class, New York City and the Invention of America. Abigail DeVille is an artist and a graduate of FIT. Maybe she's a historian also. Her work often responds to history, especially the history of African American citizens of New York. Just this week, her work Light of Freedom was installed in Madison Square Park. Please welcome Abigail DeVille. Feel free to turn on your mics and give her a little bit of applause. Thank How you. How you doing? This has been a busy week for you, huh? Yeah, it has, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the, the opening for Light of Freedom was on Tuesday, is that right? Mm -hmm. How'd it go? Yeah. It was great. It was really nice. Um, I saw lots of people I haven't seen in like almost a year because of the pandemic. Uh, my family was reunited for the first time since I think the holidays. Um, so it was it was a good turnout despite you know the threat of uh, death. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do a lot of work that's exhibited outside. And I was wondering if you feel like all of a sudden there's a new advantage to that uh, approach that you didn't realize before COVID. I think so. I think there's definitely an advantage to how scrappy my practice has been this thus far, right? Where you could just pick up the remnants of something and figure out something to make on site and with whatever is at hand. So then you don't need maybe necessarily all of these you know, all of these systems that we're used to functioning within in order to get something done. So it, it was a it was a quick process, the the whole um the whole coming together of the project and and I feel thankful and grateful that I've been able to make something that could possibly begin to address uh the myriad of things that the United States is is going through right now. Yeah. I read in the, the article in the Times that they gave you, I think, a three-month lead time, and you said that for others that would be very short, but for you it was luxurious. Yeah. Um, so do you feel <laughs> like you were able to put more thought into this project than others because you had a longer than usual lead time? I don't know. I, I work pretty instinctively, so I don't I don't know if it, it mattered as much. You know, I think... Um, I think because the Statue of Liberty is such a potent kind of symbol it, and it, it has so much already embedded within it and then layered history that I'm benefiting from as it, as it exists as a symbol. So then it doesn't feel like, you know, you, you really got to work something up here, right? Like <laughs> there's there's a lot already in there. And, uh, and usually when I go somewhere, uh, I'm there for maybe two weeks max to install. And maybe I've been thinking and researching remotely about the project for a few months leading up to it, but it's it's all very quick. And then, so I think about it as like a poetic meditation or a, almost a performance or a photograph of, you know, this being a collective effort of, you know, me being in a specific time and place and this reflecting that, not necessarily a, you know, in-depth understanding of what this location or history or, or geography is. Uh, it's funny, while you're talking uh, about sort of the sp site specificness of it and the speed with which you put it together, you're almost reminding me of Keith Haring or Jean-Michel Basquiat or somebody like that who like, you know, grew out of a graffiti tradition and had to get it done really fast because otherwise the cops were going to come and lock them away. Um, you're a little bit more legit than they are, I guess. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Light of Freedom, the actual work, and your inspiration for it? Sure. So um, when Brooke, I mean, Rappaport asked me to if I'd be interested in doing something this summer, I said, absolutely. And they provided me with some books that, on the history of Madison Square Park. And then when I was going through it, and simultaneously, I was also watching uh, Rick Burns, I think it's seven part series of, you know, New York documentary. I realized, I didn't realize before that moment that 
the torch that the hand and the torch lived in the park for six years from 1876 to 1882. So I, I was shocked and then, you know, in awe and, and I thought it was perfect. It was just like, great. <laughs> I'm done. I can stop right here, you know, and not necessarily wanting to bring, you know, all, I think this is maybe where time uh, affected certain decisions. I didn't want to think about the rendering of a giant hand, um, you know, being in the park, but thinking about the torch itself as a symbol or as a light, you know, and all the kind of metaphors that are embedded in light for uh, knowledge, pursuit of knowledge, or thinking about a fire or a passion that kind of burns, or, you know, also thinking about, well, what what is America or what is the, the meaning of democracy or how has it existed here in this country for however long um, people have been professing it, you know, like what are the things that are actually passed down from generation to generation? And so then thinking about, okay, so, you know, it could go to, you know, like ancient Greece and thinking about, you know, the, like the Olympic torch ceremony, right? Or the way that it's passed uh, from generation to generation, like a baton, thinking about, oh, well, what actually is the best of us? Like, what is the best of America? What potentially what it, it's it's unresolved, unfulfilled potential is versus, you know, um, the kinds of atrocities that it has enacted since its inception. So, um, so I was think, thinking about all of that and then also thinking about the, the racial reckoning and, and the protests that happened this summer over the murder of uh, George Floyd and thinking about what a watershed moment and and wildly optimistic that that outpouring and outshowing has continually been because you know in in contrast and thinking about oh the, the the civil rights movement right those had very specific leaders right and most of the time men that you know people would follow and here is something that is leaderless right with people with different agendas different, you know, interests, the different factions coming together and saying enough is enough. People are mourning, reeling from the pandemic, suffering economically and recognizing the suffering of Black Americans and, uh, you know, the suffering and, and recognizing Black humanity, um, I thought was, was, you know, like so positive and such like a, a beacon of hope for the future and thinking about actually, you know, though the potential of this nation has been, has remained unfulfilled, the it's still there, like the firmament, the desire for equality, for liberty, for freedom, for all of its citizens still, still resides within the people. And so then thinking about, okay, so then instead of making it like a one giant hand that could be, you know, representative of the state. And then thinking about the collective of individuals that, that continue to come together. So that's why all of the mannequin arms are there inside the, the torch of the, the flame. That's wonderful. Although I think there's sort of an ironic tension there that this is a symbol of certain people coming to America of their own free will. When right. most of New York is about the descendants of people who didn't get to choose. Um, you so see that a shift in your work in any way? Well, I, I think that's what's so great about uh, the torch as a symbol or, or thinking about or thinking through the Statue of Liberty as, as this iconic figure. Because, yeah, in the beginning of the research of the project, I was, I was shocked to learn that, you know, I didn't realize that 11 Angolans were brought as, as uh, slaves to New York City in 1626 when New Amsterdam was founded in 1624. So all of, you know, two years before the, you know, enslavement of, of black people here. And then thinking about, well, then that makes uh, black people, you know, the second oldest group of, of people here in New York next to, uh, well, you know, first, first, well, the Lenape, but you know, this, you know, the second group to come as as outsiders, um, and then thinking about the indignity and inequality that has persisted over the last four centuries of 
black folks in New York City and being able to have a kind of permanent place that isn't constantly, you know, subject to like these shifting sands and people changing the rules or constructing, you know, ghettos around them or displacing them from place to place. So I thought it was also really interesting to then find out um, the the New York Times article mentions it and there's a, a link to it within the article, but there was an article that was written in 1977 in the Times about the first black farmer community in, you know, um, lower Manhattan that acted as a buffer between um, the European or the Dutch, you know, well, European, because I think what, there were 18 different languages spoken in the early days of of New Amsterdam, but uh, this buffer zone between the Native Americans and uh, the European settlers and how these lands that they farmed, they farmed, they were feeding the colony, right? Like they were feeding New Amsterdam because the Europeans weren't interested in farming at all. They were interested in making money, which was mostly in fur at that moment. So um, it was interesting to to see that, that they were free. They were able to get their freedom from, from the uh, West India Dutch, Dutch West India company. And then when the British took over New York, they took the lands from them, right? Like they were immediately, they were pretty much seized from them and their descendants. So um, we see like, you know, like, oh, this is like, you know, the beginning of everything, how we have been on this this cyclical thing over and over again of some gains and then dispossession. Yeah. So clearly, you know, a lot of history. Do you consider yourself a historian as well as an artist? No, (laughs) there's too much to know in history, you know, like, and there's, there's so much that has been lost to time names that have been lost to time. And I think it's, um, it's hard to kind of keep clearing off dust off of, uh, information that's known. And then within a generation or two becomes unknown again. And so I feel like maybe this is why the same kinds of mistakes are repeated over and over again. I think um, I think you know it's it's interesting to have a I think past is present, and so if you're having a, a conversation with history, you're you're really trying to understand the present. Um, yeah. So I, I want to get back to your art in a little while and have some students ask you questions also, but I want to shift gears for just a second and ask you about your education and especially your time at FIT. Um, Do you think that FIT prepared you to be the kind of artist that you want to be or that you are today? I think definitely because especially in the fine arts department, there's no area of specific concentration. You're learning everything at the same time. And um, I think you, you get like probably eight semesters of sculpture and painting simultaneously, which is rare, you know, at some point, I think in the sophomore and at least junior year, in most schools, you have to pick an area uh, and, and choose. And so I think the fact that they make you do everything uh, definitely didn't restrict me to, to thinking about one specific way of working. And so then when I'm conceiving of how to communicate an idea through through a methodology, I'm, I'm thinking about what's the best way to communicate this? Like, what would be the best form instead of um, I'm a dedicated, you know, hardcore painter or sculptor or, you know, printmaker or something, you know? So I think in that way, it, it, um, it freed me from having to, you know, be dedicated to a specific kind of, uh, like a medium. Do people tend to pigeonhole you as a sculptor or as a an installation artist? I think definitely as an installation artist, just because I don't have a website, so they haven't seen anything to the contrary, right? <laughs> <laughs> so people really haven't seen paintings and and other things, and so you know they that's what that's what I'm known for, so that's what people think of. Um, that's great on the the arts education. I'm also wondering about the history education, and this is sort of my my bias here. But we've been talking a lot about this at FIT, especially since the scandal we had in the spring around the MFA show. I don't know if you know this story. Um, There was 
for the first time ever, the masters in fashion design decided to do a runway show. And they accessorized the models in a pretty offensive way. And leading on after that, and also I think it became even more salient after George Floyd's murder, there's been a lot of talk on campus about changing the curriculum so that people know more about the African-American experience, more about uh, diversity, more about oppression. And I'm wondering, do you feel like when you were at FIT, was there enough of that in your education or how would you have changed it? I mean, I think the education was pretty skewed toward European history and understanding of that. And, you know, and, and I don't think it's necessarily FIT's fault, but also the fault of the students and having zero interest in outside uh, things and just taking what's being given and not questioning. I remember multiple semesters, I wanted to take an African art history course. It never ran because students weren't interested and didn't sign up for it. Like I, I, I tried like four semesters to take an like an African history, you know, art course, something as simple as that. So, you know, I, I think there has to be a desire within the student body first before, you know, you can be this kind of like looking or pointing to the school and saying that this is your fault. I remember moments in your class being very frustrated with my classmates as to the uh, like wanton ignorance of some of the comments. And, you know, like I remember one class, you were asking if people knew who Pocahontas was. And I didn't know if people were like serious that they didn't know who she was or they just like weren't interested in participating. And so I was kind of horrified actually that these were, you know, my peers. And just like, what's wrong with these people, you know? So I, I don't know. I don't necessarily blame FIT. I also, throw some blame back at students because people um, were visually inclined and were, were crafts people and designers and makers. And so people are more interested sometimes in what something looks like versus, you know, actually what's the meaning behind, behind it. So I think um, I wouldn't know how FIT could go about in, in ways in trying to engage students to care about other cultures unless it's being, you know, pushed by them themselves. You know, Pocahontas, that reminds me of a story that one of my professors in graduate school told me that uh, Peter Wood, who used to teach the survey of American Indian history, said that every, not every year that he taught it, but like every other year, at the end of the first lecture, some white girl would come down to the front of the room and approach him and say, you know, I'm descended from Pocahontas. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and Professor Wood didn't say it to the girls usually, but he said to us, I doubt it. <laughs> Evidently, half of the Southern Bells in America. I think they're descended from um, all right, I'm going to open it up to the students. Do you guys have any questions? Why don't you raise your hand first so that we don't all shout at once and I'll call on you. If nobody has any questions, we're going to shame you like those Pocahontas girls. <laughs> Kelly, go ahead. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had a favorite piece that you've done, and if you do, why it was your favorite? I don't know. I don't usually have any favorites because, you know, like when you're in the middle of making something, you're so much in the process and then afterwards you're kind of depressed and so then you know you're just constantly looking to the next project that it's going to be better than the last one right so i don't i don't know if i have a favorite work that's that's difficult to say but i i have a favorite experience where i did a set design for peter sellers in 2014 for a midsummer's night dream in stratford like shakespeare festival in stratford ontario and he let me do whatever the heck i wanted so i like went to local farm auctions and uh, junkyards and covered a whole Masonic basement <laughs> temple like with with debris so that the audience was sitting inside of a, a black hole and the actors were at the event horizon. So I think that experience was really awesome. And, and so for that reason, it stands out. Great. Thanks, Haley. Lauren, go ahead. 
Um, I don't know if it's the way it came across in the article, but the, the picture of the of your artwork, is there a reason that you chose that specific blue for the mannequin arms? Or am I just like over thinking something? So I was like, oh, that's a very pretty, but it's like a different <laughs> color. <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, I did choose blue for a specific reason, thinking about how uh, the Statue of Liberty itself for, I don't know, I mean, I guess it's been up for almost uh, 140 years, but thinking at least for the first 75 years, it was a stone cold symbol of immigration and the American dream and, you know, the promise of America, whether that was fulfilled or not for future generations, and thinking about how most of that until maybe the 1960s was waterborne travel, right? It was like people arriving in ships and, uh, you know, and people getting emotional when they first see the Statue of Liberty when they arrive. Um, and then I was also thinking about, I, I'm dropping the name of the painting, but Faith Ringel has this really awesome painting of a Statue of Liberty with a bunch of Africans drowning in the water behind her. And so I, I was also thinking about that, but also blue is, uh, blue fire is the hottest fire that there is. And so then thinking also about the passion of of people, right? And and that's what makes this nation so great is, is the plurality of voices and experiences and thinking about that as the democratic fire uh, versus like, you know, like, any, anything anybody has to say. <laughs> Great. Julia, go ahead. Um, I know you said that your work was usually pretty instinctive, um, but when you're creating a new piece, do you usually plan what materials you use beforehand, or do you find objects to incorporate as you go? I do the research first, and that, that informs everything. So I don't just make something because I've feel like making something. I've made this elaborate process for myself where I, I'm questioning everything as to why this needs to exist or what what is what is meaningful or purposeful in making this move or this gesture. So it's really the information. Once I hone in on an on a story or a little known fact, uh, then I will meditate on that and think about that. And then the project starts to be birthed out of that, what the structure needs to be, how the, you know, the bodies that are moving through the space will interact with it and thinking about the ways that knowledge is transmitted or understood by, by our physical bodies. Um, and then like as the last like fun thing is the collection happens. And that's also more instinctive as to when I go to different places, I'm like, oh, I need this thing or, I need that thing. And usually when I touch it, I know sometimes, you know, I can just look at something and be like, no, and, you know, and then pick up something else. And, and it kind of really doesn't matter what it is. Great. Thanks. Cassandra. Sorry, I actually forgot to lower my hand. My question was the same as Lauren's. Mm -hmm. um, we were actually discussing in Julia Jaquette's painting class on Monday. Um, like we were kind of discussing your color choices and um, people were kind of throwing out guesses as to why you chose that color blue. And there were a couple of people that guessed it almost exactly right. So hmm. that's interesting. That's right. <laughs> was, was Professor Jackett in the fine arts program when you were here, Abigail? No. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think so. She's pretty terrific though. Um, she came out with a book recently about the design of playgrounds. Uh, she oh. it's like a graphic novel about the history of playgrounds and her dad who used to design. It's awesome. I recommend oh. you go check it out. I will. Uh, Katrina, go ahead. Hi. Um, I want to thank you first for your sharing. Um, it was super amazing. Um, well, Professor kind of stole my question, so I want to pivot a little bit more. Um, like what recommendations would you give um, like FIT? Like, cause I want to join like student government um, or like just at least participate or like, you know, with school, like school of dean, like, like the deans in school, sorry. And like, you know, there are so many things that we could do. Like I started to see changes people do in school. We had um, like diversity shows, like, um, the most recent one was Black in Time. And like, you know, like what could help people to want to be more interested in this culture, like in the culture. 
not just like, you know, like European or, you know, like what recommendation would you give school? Because we also attended school trustee meetings. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of things that we can do to change. I mean, I, I, I'll just kind of reiterate what I said earlier, just in thinking about that the change has to come from the students themselves and and being genuinely interested in each other. Because I, I know that the school, and I know for me, it may maybe it's changed. I mean, I graduated in 2007. So uh, when I was there, it really felt like a commuter school. And it, and it felt like it was hard to sometimes feel like a real sense of community. And but again, I didn't get involved in anything. So, you know, that also could be on me, right? But um, I'm thinking about well, how can you facilitate a genuine interest in one another? How can you learn from each other just from the wealth of information that's representative in the student body and, and the difference of culture and experience, right? That is just doesn't have to solely be based on a final outcome product, right? As uh, as graduates or what kind of you know professions or you know commercial industries you might find yourself in and thinking about a genuine exchange, right? Like college is supposed to be this place that is a, a firmament of an exchange for knowledge. And so maybe it's not just about, you know, uh, design or craft or, you know, different kinds of, and, and like, you know, making understanding, but then actually what, like what what actually could be really meaningful in in your time at FIT and learning from one another. Um, so I think probably maybe the most kinds of student led groups or student initiated conversations or I don't know film screenings or you know whatever whatever student initiative things that could happen. I think that would probably be way more beneficial than the school trying to tell you guys what it is that you need to know. Well, that undermines my authority. Thank you very much. But you know what? I do have one other thing to say that has nothing to do with you guys. And I think it might, it just might be just more symptomatic of uh, <clears throat> the ways in which we're, we're educated, like coming up. I think, you know, I was really shocked. I went through public school, New York City public school system before I went to FIT. And I was always surprised at the lack of um, black students in the school during my time time there. And I know like in the fine arts department when I was in it, I don't know what it's like now, there were a handful of black students for overall four years. And so then there's a, there's a bigger problem there, right? In terms of, well, then maybe this is why different kinds of ignorance can, ha can fester and happen because it's not reflective within the student body in, in the school. And I think that that also has to do with the kinds of supports that people do or do not have at home. Whereas is if somebody is maybe struggling financially, and of course a parent doesn't ever think that, you know, um, a career in the arts might be something that is potentially lucrative or something that they're going to encourage. So I'm not sure what the numbers are like for, for black students now at the school, but I think, you know, that's that's something that's also an underlying issue. Lauren, you have one more question? Yes, yeah, I have one more. In relation to what you were saying just a little like a minute ago, how do you think, because I agree that a lot of things have to be like student initi initiated for no matter what it is. How do you think it's, how, how do you, what do you think would be a way to make students care about other types of cultures rather than their own? Because like, even I don't know the answer. Like, I'm just curious about what you think. Well, I mean, what do you care about, right? Like thinking about, well, like, you know, I think um, I'm gonna butcher her last name, but Greta, you know, the, the Swedish girl last year, like, you know, really making, yeah. Make, yeah, that whole initiative that went internationally, right? Where students were walking out of school because yeah, there's a plant, we all have to live on this planet, right? And thinking about, well, what are the kinds of issues that are happening right now? that we actually should care about as a community, or maybe one or two people are really fervent and passionate about it and can, you know, kind of spear, spearhead some sort of initiative to get other students to care about 
this particular thing or give information. I mean, it's hard to make people care, period, right, about anything. But maybe if you can, you know, you can talk to someone and have a conversation, you can change their mind about something. Um, I mean, that's that's all. Uh, I apologize for the banging upstairs, if you can hear that. Uh, Morgan? Hi. Um, so I have a question about your work. I know that a lot of your pieces um, are only displayed for a certain amount of time. So I was just wondering if after it's over, do you keep them all someplace or do you disassemble them and reuse pieces? I'm very fascinated with like the, I guess, like the time period. Is that part of it? It's only for a limited time. Yeah, it's only for a limited time. Most of the time, I, I, everything goes back to wherever it came from. The goes back to the waste stream. About ninety percent of it. If there's something that I really like, I'll keep. Like a, an installation I did a couple like two years ago. There was a lot of stuffed animals in it, and there was a poker playing, uh, le like leather daddy uh gorilla i kept that because that was just too weird you know there was a stuffed animal that was a flea i mean i never seen that before you know like there were weird things that i kept but most of the time it's just it goes right back i can't be committed i already have four storage units i i can't be committed to you know taking on any any more of somebody else's stuff I, i'm 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 good uh, if you want to get rid of those mannequins at some point, uh, the blue mannequin leg, let us know. We'll, we'll take them off your hands. <laughs> I'll never get rid of mannequins. <laughs> <laughs> There's time for one more question. You have time for one more question, Abigail? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, Julia, go ahead. Okay, I was just wondering about your work. Um, how do you normally, sorry, my voice is like going. Um, how do you normally inform viewers of like the history or the meaning behind each piece? Do you generally have like plaques associated with them or do you leave it open to interpretation? I leave it open to interpretation most of the time. I mean, in, in this instance, there's a Frederick Douglass quote that accompanies the sculpture, but, um, and a little bit of, of the history of New York, but most of the time it's it's really open-ended and, and I'm hoping that the information is doing the work. The information, the the material is in, as information that is revealing to the viewer what uh, what this potentially means. And a lot of time, because the stuff is locally sourced, people have an understanding of that particular thing anyway. And so you know, people, it's jogging people's memories, or they're seeing like some snippet of childhood. And so it's like a it's a collective understanding of the material, but then framed in another way that hopefully they're getting something different out of it. I want to ask one more question also. Uh, I'm a little curious about your background in reality television. And uh, given that we're living in the uh, first reality TV presidency right now, I'm wondering if you have any shifted views on your experience. Uh, I mean, Okay, I was the only black person on the show, so I was also very... First, tell us a little bit about the show. I don't know if I've... <laughs> okay, yeah, so the show was called Art Star. There was an open call that Jeffrey Deitch had at his gallery, Deitch Projects, in... I don't know when that was. Uh, I guess maybe February 2005. I think I was like a maybe a ju in my junior year, something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I showed up. A friend, a classmate of mine at FIT told me about the open call. It was like hundreds of people came standing outside in the snow, bringing their work to like get on this show because supposedly at the end of it, you were gonna get a, a gallery exhibition at the gallery. And they chose eight people. And then we all had a studio together uh, south of Canal Street for about a month. They took us on all kinds of field trips and we had to collaborate on the first parade and making like a float some sort of float presentation together. And there was a lot of uh, conflicting personalities. And so people didn't get along so well. I mean, it was it was fun. It was definitely fun. Uh, it, it opened my eyes about lots of things about the New York art world that I didn't recognize or understand before that moment. I think it was definitely pivotal in my development as, as an artist. Um, yeah, I, it was really important. And and before that, 
that experience. So we had a group exhibition together, I think in February, 2006. And right before our exhibition opened, uh, a Belgian collector just happened to be at the gallery, like shopping, you know, like <laughs> picking out stuff that he wanted. And he bought my painting before it was even on the wall. And so for me, that that was like, oh, wow, I can actually do this. Like, wait, you can make money doing this? You know, like I didn't, you know, I hadn't even thought of that before that moment. And so I didn't even have a bank account. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have nothing, right? Like, so like it, it was, it was, uh, it was a big moment for me. And um, as as it functions as a reality show, there, it's not high stakes drama at all. It really is more PBS or like art world slow than you know like The Apprentice or you know Survivor or anything else like that. But um, it was a fun thing to do. So you, you don't feel guilty or responsible for having built up the uh, reality TV world and bringing us to the point we're at right now. It's not my fault. Blame MTV and the first season of Real World. What's that, like 1992-93? That's who started this mess. So, so the blame gets put solely on them. All right, fair enough. Uh, do you have to go teach or do you have a few more minutes for us? I have a few more minutes. Actually, my class is starting later today, so... Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, I have more questions, but if anybody else has another question, I'll let you jump in first. Okay, I wanted to ask you about your piece, Harlem Tower of Babel. Um, I am fixated on the Tower of Babel story. I actually got to set up this class with a work of art that I did in the background about the Tower of Babel, but the connection wasn't working there. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the story of the Tower of Babel means to you and what this piece means to you. No, I'm just thinking about it. I mean, it was 2012. Give me a second. <laughs> um, I think that 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 piece was definitely meaningful for me because uh, I'm thinking about maybe the structure of of the Tower of Babel and thinking about the the moment in which you know, potentially all of these languages happen where everybody was collectively working towards this one goal. And then in an instant, people were unable to understand each other. And uh, thinking about how words could translate as ma material or be fragmented as as material. I think um, Maya Angelou has this really beautiful quote that she says in a, there's an interview with her with Dave Chappelle. I don't know if you've all seen it, but uh, an Iconoclast episode that's really, really good. I recommend uh, you watch it. It's on YouTube. But she talks about the power of words and how, you know, they get stuck to the wall or to the arm of the chair or, you know, in the crux of your elbow kind of thing. And thinking about the, the power that, that is contained within a word and then how, um, when a word is spoken, it can bring you to the past or it can bring you, you know, kind of to the future. Like if you speak words that were spoken in the past, then you're reenacting the past and the present. But anyway, thinking about the connection between words and objects. And uh, so that is why I think I chose the structure of that. And, and then thinking about a collective understanding of the ways in which uh, I guess low income or poor New Yorkers have lived uh, over centuries in New York City, but I was thinking more specifically like 19th century to like maybe now or, or yeah, late 20th century. Um, and I went, there was this really beautiful exhibition, or I went to the the Tenement Museum, is that gone now? I saw some, some sad article about that they were closing, or is that not true? You're mute. <laughs> what, Professor, you're so mute. You're Professor, mute. You're so mute. <laughs> I can't hear you. I'm sorry, folks. I've been trying to avoid the hammering upstairs. Uh, I don't think that it's gone. The last that I heard was that they were uh, creating a restaurant in Essex Market where they were going to have uh, traditional food, but that was before COVID. I haven't seen anything since COVID. Uh, is there news that the Tenement Museum is closing? I thought I saw that maybe 
maybe like three, two or three months ago because of COVID, but I'm Could not. Be. That would be terrible. It would be terrible. Anyway, that museum is really beautiful. I encourage you all to go to it if it still exists at the end of this. But um, it was it was combined with that and a photography exhibition that I saw at Columbia um, around the same time, I guess, in, in, 20, in 2012. Uh, whatever, or or the end of 2011, but but it was three or four social documentarians and and one uh, Jacob Reese who heavily documented you know um, the inequities of the poor and how people were living in the Lower East Side and and you know little street urchin children and everything. But anyway, so thinking about the ways in which this city that has been built around commerce as being the heart and soul of it. And then the kind of ways that the workers have been like, you know, left to, you know, to their own devices or, or to, to the wind and from, from multiple centuries and, and how people live in different spaces. So uh, the interior of the top part of the sculpture were objects that I had collected from my grandmother's house and she had passed away at the end of 2011. And then the bottom portion of the sculpture and the exterior of it were all objects that I had collected from Dead Horse Bay. Um, do you guys know where that is in Brooklyn? <laughs> Dan, you, you talk about Dead Horse Bay? <laughs> a lot of dead horses, man. It's sort of a, uh, a grounds where all sorts of stuff uh, and it's gross. You have more to say about it? There was an and article about it in The New Yorker a few years ago. Was one I, I, learned I feel like I have uh, information about it that I've mythologized for myself that isn't exactly historically accurate. <laughs> so I don't really want to talk about it. But there don't are. We all do that though. Yeah. That's <laughs> There's uh, there are like Depression era Clorox bottles on the beach. Like you go to this beach and there is trash from 80 years ago on the beach, and it's all encrusted into the landscape, and it's. It's a beautiful place. It's really beautiful. But anyway, so I uh, maybe illegally harvested all of this inf material from the beach, and that ended up being the exterior uh, material for the, the sculpture. I guess one of the reasons also why that resonated so much with me uh, was that your current piece is in Madison Square Park, and the skyscrapers on the east side of the park are really important in the history of skyscraper construction, the MetLife building in particular, and the Flatiron building to the south. Um, and when I think of the Tower of Babel story, it makes me think of skyscrapers and what would God think of Madison Square Park in that neighborhood? Um, I guess I also wanted to ask you about the uh, piece you did about the Harlem slave burial grounds and whether it was inspired by the African burial ground downtown in that area that you were discussing earlier where there used to be African-American farms, or if there were any other historical inspirations beyond just that location. That question was too specific. Tell us about the piece. <laughs> no, I, I, I like your question. No, I'm... Um, I'm thinking about why I was initially interested or drawn to that space, maybe because it was still being ignored. And actually where the site where I made the piece was not where the burial ground is. There is a now defunct MTA bus depot on top of the burial ground. And there were, through the persistence of some uh, church ladies in Harlem, there was a church who owned the the burial ground in the 19th century. I guess some of their parishioners had been buried there. And it, you can see it in old city blueprints that there was there were cemeteries there. The white bodies were, were taken up and moved to the North Bronx and the black bodies were sifted in with continual kinds of development that happened on the sites. So uh, I think in 2016, there was a there was an article, like January 2016, there was an article in the New York Times about the, the bus depot or about that specific burial ground. And when I had made the piece, it was in 2014. Through the persistence of these ladies, they got demanded that the city start to excavate the site. And they dug down maybe six feet before they hit like a skull, before they got human remains. And so 
that I don't I don't know what's going on with the site now. I, I think there's like other developers that are involved and maybe they're trying to make something of the site. I'm not quite sure. But um I'm just thinking about how history, you know, is present everywhere that we are. We just don't, you know, we're not we're not cognizant to it, we're not listening to it. And and so that was really um and I think I was also in in response to the kinds of change and development that has happened in Harlem over the last 15, 20 years, and maybe more radically in the last 10. Um, but I think that's also the part of the reason why I made uh, made something there. I assume you mean gentrification. Yeah, gentrification. But then, you know, like if you go, like, putting gentrification on a shelf for a second and then thinking about the creation of, you know, of quote unquote black ghettos in the thirties by redlining. Right. And so then you leave a group of people, you create a ghetto around them. Like, you know, the, the city before the 1930s was really integrated. People, people lived with everyone. And then, you know, the federal government in the 1930s decided to make these lines around neighborhoods and to devalue the properties where black people lived. So it, it ended up segregating black people into specific neighborhoods. And so then those neighborhoods were denied uh, resources from the federal government for, I don't know, 70 years or something. And then all of a sudden, people who don't know that that happened or people who are growing up in these neighborhoods don't even know that, that this is the reason why this exists. And people from other places come, have no idea that this is what the history is of this neighborhood. But the rent is cheap here, so I'm going to live here. And you know, it's it's a like it's a tenuous kind of balance, right? And thinking about the inequities that establish these neighborhoods, the idea of whether it's worth it to preserve the history and to have a safe place for people to be able to live, regardless of how much money they have, versus you know people coming in and and disrupting that that whole balance and then the speculation and and real estate kind of you know evil interest that is that that just is is a part of the whole thing um yeah yeah so you were talking about the rick burns documentary earlier he's got a whole section on redlining in there mm -hmm. um and i actually saw that episode at a film festival when he was first making the documentary and in the Q&A afterwards, there was this one guy who was a white man who was furious at Rick Burns and said, how dare you bias this documentary by talking all this stuff about redlining? And all Rick Burns was, well, it happened. And it's a story that a lot of people don't know. People assume that residential segregation has been always with us. And it's just not true. And so I think people struggle with hearing that story. Absolutely. Um, do you think that if you were an artist in another city that you could tell the same sorts of stories or is there something about New York that makes your art possible? I think maybe I will say, I will give it, uh, give New York credit as to raising me and, and thinking well, maybe because I was constantly um, introduced to multi-cultures, like continuously, always being introduced into, like, uh, just by eating a different kind of food, right? Or, or my dad grew up with Jewish people in the Bronx in the 1950s and 60s, and so I was like raised on, you know, cream cheese, like really good, high-quality lox, right, and good bagels, right, because in other places, people don't know what a bagel is, right, and they don't know what good lox is, but, you know, like, and, and thinking about, like, that was, like, part of my, you know, Saturday morning breakfast in elementary school, you know what I mean? There's all this cross-cultural pollination that's happening around that's shaping the way that you think, so maybe me thinking and not having a respect for history and people's stories and different and different ways to to uh, share stories feeling like I had uh, the liberty to 
to do that or the permission to do that or I didn't need anyone's permission to do that. I can go into another city and just land in from, you know, New York from nowhere and do a little research and digging around and make something that's telling them about themselves, which is kind of, you know, is a little obnoxious, right? But um, I think maybe, you know, I blame New York for that. Uh, Katrina, do you have a follow-up question about bagels? <laughs> Katrina's writing a research paper about bagels right now. Oh, cool. Uh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I had one more question, um, which has, the bagel like pushed it completely out of my mind. Uh, we were also talking about uh, food before you got here. Uh, spicy Moon and Dan Noodles. Evidently get the thumbs up from everybody. Uh, Katrina, do you want to jump in? You're good. Okay. Um, anybody else have a last question? All right. Well, I think we should move on to Bohemian Greenwich Village now. So I'm going to say goodbye to Abigail DeVille. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been really wonderful. You. If you guys want to turn on the mics for a little applause, that would be great also. Or just a visual applause. Uh, be well, good luck with uh, the Madison Square Park piece and everything else in your future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.